And that thing that you did in terms of the sharing is called the division algorithm. What is a division algorithm? It's share like you every child has ever shared, <laughs> right? One for you and one for you. Ooh, there's more than enough to share. One for you and one for you and one for you. Oh, still more to share. One for you, one. Oh, I don't have enough, right? So what is the division algorithm? So A is an amount. That can be any integer. If it's positive, what do you consider it? Something to share. What if it's negative? You consider it as people needing to pay a bill, right? It's owed, and you need to start taking away from people. On the other hand, D, which is the not the amount, it's the people doing the dividing. Obviously, when you start sharing, this is actually kind of an important question. Can zero people divide anything? That makes no sense. So zero, when we say things, well, can zero divide stuff? That's a silly question. That doesn't make any sense. Nobody showing up can't divide. Divide makes only sense if people try to actually share. You need someone. So that's why divide, division, dividing, doesn't allow zero. Right? So we immediately throw away zero. Does negative people make sense? <coughs> Sorry. Negative people makes no sense. So what it is, if people show up, the people doing the dividing, it has to be one, two, three, four. We have to have somebody. No zeros, no negatives. It makes no sense. OK, what is the division algorithm? What happens is there are unique q and r, which are both integers. And r is always greater than or equal to 0, yet less than d. Such that the amount can be broken up into everybody gets Q and we have a remainder. That's what I was doing up here. Words. Um, A, which is the amount that you're sharing, is called the dividend. The thing that you're trying to share. D, the people trying to do the sharing, are called the divisor. Q, what everybody gets, is called the quotient. In R, what's left over when you can't share evenly anymore is called the remainder. Words for the quotient is also called the div. Words for the remainder is also called the mod. So example. Uh, 17, if you have 17 coins and we have three people show up, what's the division algorithm? Those 17 coins, each person gets how much? How much will everybody get? Five. What's the remainder? Two. So 17, what's the word for 17? It is the dividend. 3 is the divisor. 5 is the quotient, or the div. And 2 is the remainder, or the mod. Let's go the other way. What if you owe a bill of $17 and you have three people needing to pay? How much money will you have to collect to actually pay the bill? How much do you owe? 17 bucks. So how much are you going to have to collect from everybody to cover the bill? What if you collected $5 from everybody? How much money did you collect? Does that pay it? No. So how much do you have to collect? Six. Right. If I collect $6 from everybody, how much money have you collected? 18. Can you pay the bill? Yes. And what would be left over? This is important. This is why I usually like to talk about bills. People are like, like, if you put, people will do things like, well, that's negative 5 and negative 2. What do you mean negative 2? You haven't paid the bill. Right? The remainder has to be positive. The remainder must be positive. It makes no sense if you haven't covered the bill. 
you have to collect enough to pay the bill. So what is the dividend? Negative 17. What is the divisor? 3. What is the quotient? And what is the remainder? So we should be able to do these, right? These are things that we do in everyday life. You should be able to go through here. Now, if I could handle the div and the mod as operations, right? I can actually sit there and say that if I was only interested in the quotient and I was only and I was only interested in the remainder, sometimes we're only interested in those. I could actually handle them as operators and we could do things like uh, I typically when you would write it in the textbook we would say a div d would spit out the quotient a mod d would spit out the remainder programming wise how is this normally written it's the div of a and d it's the mod of a and d that would be equal to q and that would be equal to r so sometimes we'll write them as functions themselves this is called infix notation where you put the thing that you're doing in between the things that you're working on this is functional notation which is actually prefix that's where you say what you do before you say what you do it to. I'm going to div these two things. And so the book does infix. Most people, have, if you've written any programs, they don't usually do infix. They do prefix or postfix. But we need to be able to do it. So for example, on this question, what would negative 18 mod 4 be? And what would say 18 mod 4? What am I asking for? I'm asking for the remainder of what am I doing. Negative 18, think about it as a bill, right? How much do you owe? $18. How many people are there? Four. So how much are you going to have to collect to pay the bill? I'm going to have to collect five bucks so I can get the 20 bucks, right? If I collect five from everybody, that's 20. And so what's going to be left over? Two. two. I'll have paid the bill, and there'll be $2 left over, and you just say, hey, that's the tip. On the other hand, a positive 18 would be like, hey, look, there's $18 $1 bills before people show up. All right, and they fight for it. How much does everybody get fairly? We all get four. Oh, darn it, this is one that actually ends up being the same answer. Anyways, two. Why? Because negative 18 is equal to 4 times a minus 5 plus 2 and this is because 18 is equal to 4 times 4 plus 2 so we spit out the 2 on each of those what would be negative 18 div 4 what would that spit out that'd be spit out a negative 5 everybody has to pay 5 bucks what is 18 div 4 Four, because everybody gets four bucks, right? And that's all because this and this. If you understand the division algorithm, it's easy. You just have to figure out which thing you're talking about. So we have to memorize. We have to memorize certain things. We have to memorize names. Does so everybody understand what the mod and the div are trying to do? And it, uh, we're still within toddler range of mathematics, right? We're just counting one for you, one for you, and doing successor functions. That's all we're working with. Okay, now one of the things that we noticed on mods is it seems that mods are useful. Because what happens is the mod being this A is equal to D times Q plus R, the R is always between zero yet less than d. So it doesn't matter what a does. So for, if we would take, for example, all ints, say 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, negative 4, negative 5. If I would take mod 3, what is 0 mod 3? 
Zero mod three. Everybody gets zero. How much is left over? Nothing. What's one mod three? Everybody gets nothing, right? You don't have enough, so everybody has one left over. What's two mod three? Two. What's three mod three? Zero. Everybody gets one. There's nothing left over. What's four mod three? What's five mod three? What is negative one mod three? You take one dollar from everybody, pay your bill of two bu of one buck, and there's two dollars left. What is negative two mod three? One. What's negative three mod three? Everybody catch the pattern? When I take mod three, all numbers are going to be broken up to three things. A remainder of zero, a remainder of one, and a remainder of two. What do you notice about the remainders of zero? They're all the multiples of three. What do I notice about the remainders of one? They're not multiples of three, but they are how far apart? They're always three apart. What about two? They're always three apart. What do I notice about the number four and the number of negative five? How far apart are they? Nine. Is nine divisible by three? Yes. What do I notice about five and negative four? How far apart are they? Nine. Is that a multiple of three? Yes. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use modulus. I'm going to use remainder and talk about distances of mod three and say, you know what? I'm going to break these, the entire number line into three groups. Those who remainders are zero, those who remainders are one, those who remainders are two, and I'm going to call them the same. Everybody who has a remainder of zero that are actually divisible by three, I'm going to call the same. It's the stuff divisible by three. Everybody who has a remainder of one, I'm going to call them the same, because when I divided it, I had a one left over. It's not divisible by three, but it's one off. Is everybody okay with this idea? And so what we're going to use on this is we have a new type of same, a new comparison. And we're going to define this new type of comparison, and we're going to call it congruent. A is congruent to B under modulo M. Right, because we have to talk about divisibility. Well, what are you dividing by? Because that, that, that'll make your groups. So what does it mean to be congruent to M? What I mean by to be congruent to M and symbols are this. A, B, this is not, I put the mod M in parentheses to kind of make, I have to tell you what you're under, right? And what symbol would you like? Well. <laughs> Two means equal. These aren't exactly the same, so we're going to use three lines. Better yet, this is this is the textbook. More common is this. I like this one better. You did, you need to know modulo m, and it's supposed to be under modulo m. Let's just put it under the triple line. Everybody okay with that? Uh, when does this happen? If and only if m divides a minus b. There's a theorem for this that actually has two other variations. a is congruent to b modulo m if and only if. We could write it like this. a mod m is equal to b mod m. What is that saying? They have the same remainder. You could also say that A is B. It's just off by a bunch of M's. It's like M, 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 M. OK, it's a multiple of M away. These all mean the same thing. So this, it'd be, this is the definition. This and this are logically, these all mean same thing. Those all mean congruency. 
The reason why they're a theorem is because I could use a definition to prove the other two. Now, so what's the point of having congruency? Why, why have this new type of same? Well, this new type of same actually introduces some kind of a little bit of fun mathematics. Um, under college algebra, what can you add to both sides of inequality so that nothing changes? To both sides, right? Anything we want, right? If I add both sides, anything I want, as long as it's like plus 3 and plus 3 on both sides, it would be the same, right? What can I add to an object all by itself so nothing changes? Zero. What can I multiply by so that a single thing so it doesn't change? One. What can I multiply both sides of an equation by so it doesn't change? Not, any, not just anything you're, you, except for what one particular number. Zero. I cannot multiply by the multiplicative dominator. Now, if I looked at our example from above, we had things like 0 is congruent under modulo 3 to 3, which is congruent under modulo 3 to 6, which is congruent under modulo 3 to 9, which is congruent under modulo 3 to negative 3, dot, dot, dot. Oh, that didn't look like a 3. But 1 was congruent under 3 to 4, which is congruent under 3 to 7. But that was congruent under 3 to negative 2. And 2 was congruent under 3 to 5, which was congruent under 3 to 8. But that was congruent to negative 1. And we'd go on, right? We're just simply adding and subtracting 3s. Now, what am I saying? All of these infinite numbers are the same. So under mod 3, every one of those numbers is what? 0. For that entire second line, every one of those numbers is what? 1. For the third line, every single one of those numbers is 2. So I've taken all numbers from negative infinity to infinity and dropped them down to 0, 1, or 2. Now we have kind of a nice little feature. Properties. Well, if A is congruent to B and C is congruent to D, which means they're the same, what can happen? I can add the same thing to both sides. I can multiply the same thing to both sides. Not only that, what is that? that's an A. Okay. <laughs> so that means if you would have something like x is congruent to 5 under modulo 4, and you would notice that 7 under modulo 4 would be congruent to what? What would be a number 4 off of 7? 11. That means I could add a 7 on one side and add an 11 on the other side. Same answer. So now we have a whole lot of freedom. Not only can you have one number, we can actually do anything that's congruent, which we can do, take anything that you want from this group and add it or subtract it, it won't change the answer. Our algebra just became a whole lot more fun. You don't just pick one number, you have a bunch of them. And they're all the same.